I think one of the great challenges is, um, I suppose in science, how do you how do you ever know that you know, right? There's that there's that old there's that old question. You know, you you can you know what you don't know. Yeah, we think we're we're good on that, but you don't know if you fully know. So I suppose we're we're, we're walking, and I have got philosophical. I'm sorry, it's your fault though. Um, but you you what what we what we do with time is we become more and more aware of how individual volcanoes will behave or the sorts of behaviors we might see in advance of eruptions so we we can know that that will become something that we we get better at we get better at with time as we get more data and more understanding of how to interpret those data but can we ever imagine that we'll be in a scenario where there won't be a kind of black swan event where a volcano does something completely out of the box um I, I suppose statistically it would become less likely as we know more, but could we ever philosophically know that we will know everything? I don't know. <laughs> You've got me there though. I'm Adam Vaughan. I'm the environment editor for The Times and I'm joined today by Andrew McGonagall in Sydney, Australia. Andrew, would you mind introducing yourself for listeners? Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Andrew McGonagall. I'm a, I'm a Rolex laureate, and I'm interested in applying technology to solve problems, particularly in the context of volcanology. Have you worked in Have you worked in other sciences? Has that always been your field? So I've done. So I started out in physics, um, and in some ways, if you if you take me apart, I'm probably really a physicist. Uh, so I guess I've 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 always had twin passions. Um, I've, I've been interested in how the world works from a fundamental point of view, which, which obviously physics addresses. I'm interested in technology as well. And then I'm interested in, in, the, in the natural environment, which is around us as well. And, and, and what I've been doing has been a nice way of linking all of these disparate interests together. For people listening, they might think of volcanoes probably, they might know them largely through what they've seen on the screen, right? In the news, in disaster movies, in documentaries. I mean, what as a scientist, what sort of level of risk do volcanoes still pose in this day and age? Yeah, it's still 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 considerable. I mean, overall, not not as vast as the risk that, for example, we've seen posed through recent catastrophic earthquake incidents, um, but still significant, uh, still something that we need to be very mindful of in terms of the world that we live in. Um, so, so yeah, still, still a highly significant risk. We, we tend to not think of it very much because in a sense, we're not, we're not living on the precipice of one of these things, at least, you know, most of the listeners won't be. Um, but there's plenty of other people in other parts of the world who, who live right next to very active volcanoes. Where do, where do they sort of sit to, to provide a bit of context? Where do they sit in like the pantheon of kind of natural disasters for human and economic mm. damage? Well, earth, earthquakes would certainly be much higher up. Um, so, um, but then, of course, as you know, as 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 things go further forward, and as climate change becomes more of an issue, that you know, currently sort of baseline level of risk attached to that has the potential to eclipse absolutely everything in terms of the the economic cost that could be attached to that. Got you. And in, just in terms of the the risk um, from volcanoes, I mean, how. It might seem obvious, but but how is that sort of elevated in low and middle income countries where you know many of them are located? Mm. Well, there may be um, there may be acute issues in terms of where where buildings can take place. So in those contexts, people might end up building in areas where in in other parts of the world building wouldn't happen. Um, there may also be a more limited financial resource in terms of infrastructure, in terms of in terms of monitoring. So. I suppose there'd be a coalescence of issues in terms of physical location where people live, and then also in terms of the preparedness um, of the of of those states to respond to these incidents when they when they do take place. So planning or zoning laws might mean that pe- more people are at risk than they would be perhaps in a in a, in a more, perhaps higher income country. Yeah, Th- that's right. That's right. Exactly. And are there any sort of striking statistics in terms of that level of risk? Mm. Well, I mean, one is that in the last 100 years or so, about 100,000 people have died as a consequence of volcanism. So, you know, it's certainly enough for us to, to, to take seriously going, going forwards. Got you. And, and in terms of that, you know, you talked today of 100,000 people 
um, dying over the last century or so. And I mean, that's obviously a huge human toll. I just wondered, how, obviously, they cause they can cause great destruction to property and to the local ecology, presumably as well. I just wondered, have you have you had much experience of that firsthand? Mm. Yes, and I think you know volcanoes are funny things because you know, for example, an earthquake. There's 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 literally nothing to like about an earthquake. It's it generates this this um, schism within the earth, which just causes destruction. It leaves nothing behind, which you know to like if you like. Whereas a volcano leaves this topographical form, which can actually be quite beautiful. It can it can provide nutrients. Um, in the soil, which can you know be the source of vineyards and, and and create very very fertile places for people to perform ag- agriculture, which can be the draw for people to end up li- living near there. Um, so so yeah, I've seen a number of uh, going back to your question. I've seen a number of vol- volcanic eruptions, um, and uh, some of them have have been very painful and devastating for people living living in that area. One, one that springs to mind was a number of years ago, we were in, in Hawaii and actually I was there to do a research project, actually funded by Rolex, um, but a research project looking at ultraviolet light and, and, and the impact of that on, on human beings and how it might vary in different ecosystems. Anyway, when we were there, uh, the volcano erupted. Um, it had started erupting before we arrived, but we hadn't really gone there to, to study the vol- volcanology of the island. And, and, and while we were there, um, we went out in a boat to, to observe from the water uh, the, the lavas as they, as, they, as they met the sea. And we were still, the boat was stationed some distance off the, um, off the coastline. And, and I put my hand in the water and the water was like bath water because of the sheer thermal energy from the lava. And notwithstanding the, the great problems that caused because of the communities that were flooded in the lava and the people that had to relocate, that was a very gripping example to me of the reality of this because i think even you know when you've been used to being on volcanoes and talking about mm-hmm. being on volcanoes and teaching about being on volcanoes when you see the real thing it it you know it it takes you back again and again there's Mark sounds quite it's quite a visceral example of the power i guess that's right that's 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 exactly right um another 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 example of a place that we've we've always liked to go to is Stromboli in southern Italy, which which erupts every ten minutes or so, and it's like a natural fireworks show. Uh, again, that's a, that's a slightly tamer example, but still, when you when you hear the noises and you see what happens, there's something otherworldly about it, which is mm. which is which is you see things and you smell things and you hear things which you just wouldn't hear in any of in any other context. What was the uh, what was the volcano in Hawaii? Is it Mauna Loa? Or um, so the so the eruption was well, it was it was it was the eruption itself was from part of the rift system um, that was related to to Kilauea vol- volcano. Got you. Okay, great. Because I always think of that. I always think of Hawaii because covering climate change a lot. I always think of it as the uh, for the CO two record that they keep there, obviously from the atmosphere. That's right, and and it's absolutely fascinating because in fact that's why we were that. One of the one of the things we did while we were there was we went up to the top and we went to Mauna Loa Observatory, and of course that observatory is so important because it's where that long term carbon dioxide data set was acquired, which you're talking about by Keeling. So the Keeling curve came from there, whereby we can we can see the increase in carbon dioxide levels since the Industrial Revolution. So that's kind of what we were there to study. But meanwhile, down <laughs> down in the valley, if you like, this this volcano was kicking off. But interestingly, the more recent eruption was um, last year. What uh, arose from not far, actually, from the from the observatory, much closer to the summit of, of Mauna Loa. Got you, got you. That's really helpful. And, and for people listening, if you want to look on YouTube or other video platforms are available, this is the uh, number that David Attenborough referred to throughout his speech at COP twenty six. So you, I'm sure you remember, Andrew. Um, so I just wanted to, Andrew, if you could cast your mind back a bit now. Um, I suppose I wanted to ask where your fascination for volcanoes came from. Well, I I was I was very fortunate in that I grew up in Edinburgh in Scotland. Now um, that you don't win any prizes when it comes to weather, um, nor, nor possibly when it comes to breadth of diet or ingestion of vitamins. Um, but anyway, I survived. And uh, what what I kind of grew up, I grew up with a mixture of observing this spectacular scenery in the Scottish Highlands 
And also in, in Edinburgh, as you, as you may well know, Edinburgh is a city built on seven hills, all of which are, are volcanic in some way or another. So I grew up as a kid running around Arthur's seat um, with the school cross-country running club. And, oh God, and, I've, I've, I've run up there as well. That's not an easy hill to run up. <laughs> well, have you? Have you? So uh, cross, cu- cross, country, cross country like you. <laughs> yeah, well, good, for, well, good. Well, you survived as well. <laughs> You d- you didn't you didn't grow up in Scotland though, so you were probably better. No, I, no, I'm a southern, I'm a softy southerner. No, but sorry, you were you were saying you you grew no, up you grew up running around the hills. I hope my mum's not listening to this. Um, so yes, so I grew up running around the hills, and 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 then of course these were volcanoes, and of course these you know these sites were so important within the development of modern geology with, you know, people like Hutton and all these other characters. I and mean, to, to some extent, modern geology came from these people as they made observations on people like that, on places like that. So that was sort of part of my early ingestion of science, passively or actively. And then attached to that, again, in Edinburgh, Edinburgh was this, this incredible intellectual place in terms of the Enlightenment. And then thereafter, there were incredible scientists like obviously James, James Clark Maxwell. So I, I, so I, within this whole environment, I developed this kind of twin passion of, of, of physics and understanding the world from a fundamental point of view, but also the spectacular and sheer beauty of nature. And I remember actually at school doing an art project and I'd chosen to do rocks. And, and I remember sitting, um, as I must have been about 14 years old, sketching Salisbury crags on this on the side of Arthur's seat and I had this almost existential moment when I was just blown away by you know the absolute awe and grandeur of these rocks that are millions of years old and I don't even think at that point I realized this is a volcanic sill um so I think I think that's been in my ether if I can use that term for for quite some time and I was fortunate enough to find a pathway of putting those two things together Got you, and and where that's really interesting. And, and where where what was the sort of moment where you sort of jumped from physics to volcanoes? What was what what what, what triggered that? Yeah, so I done um, so I so I did physics all the way through in terms of my education. I did undergrad in theoretical physics, and and then I did a did a doctorate um, in developing lasers for pollution monitoring in the atmosphere, mm. and which I'd really enjoyed doing, um, and that had been very useful in terms of developing my skill set. But I really wanted to do something in in the wild. I wanted to take this technology or some sort of analogous technology and apply it in the wild. And actually, I'd got to the point, I'd been looking around at jobs and nothing had really clicked. And I'd got to the point where I thought, nah, I'm I'm done. Science isn't going to happen. I'll go and you know do, some, do something else. And I'm sure that would have been wonderful. But then I came across uh, an article by Clive Oppenheimer um, in Cambridge University. Uh, Clive was the... Um, the the sort of leading guy in in um, uh, in the the Netflix film um, that, that that came came out recently with well a couple of years ago with Werner Herzog, any which is wonderful and people might want to might want to look that up um, into the inferno and uh, I just sent Clive a speculative email saying here I am here's my CV uh, have you got anything coming up he emailed back within about ten minutes to say. Uh, I've just found out we've got a position funded. Um, come through, let's let's have a chat. So we had a chat. One thing led to the other. I got hired by him, and then I was able. And and look, huge shout out to him and thank you, Clive. Much appreciated. Uh, he had the breadth of mind, I think, to see that someone coming in from a very different background might be able to co- pitch in and you know do something useful in this area. So yeah, I was probably within days of doing something completely different but thanks to clive we're having this conversation <laughs> nice so uh, glad, glad you sent that email um, so i mean how much do we really understand andrew about volcanoes and predicting their eruptions i think i think we understand more and more i think that um you one must also one must always in this sort of thing um have a a healthy dose of humility and, and respect given the subjects that we're looking at we're looking at um, as technology has advanced as as the data that we have on volcanic behavior has advanced exponentially over over the last few years our understanding has, has advanced exponentially as well one of the challenges is 
that may be a little bit like a human patient presenting with a disease, that no two volcanoes are identical. And therefore, their presentations in advance of the, the outbreak of the disease, i.e. the eruption, might be rather different. And indeed, it's possible for some volcanoes to do maybe slightly different things in advance of different eruptions. So the challenge really is to try and gather as much data as possible in order to try and really nail down what does this volcano do before you know before something might happen and another challenge is that volcanic eruptions and this is in a sense a good thing are are in a sense relatively rare and so it's not like you know we've we've observed millions and millions of these things as we would have done for example in presentation of particular disease in, in human beings so it's kind of a catch-22 we want more eruptions so that we can get more of an idea mm-hmm how it happens but we don't want more eruptions because we don't want more eruptions that's it's really interesting as a sort of layman i i i suppose i hadn't really realized that you know even though there's some volcanoes that'll be really well studied because they're near to where people live that you can't necessarily generalize from that and mm. mod, you know model what will happen to other volcanoes i hadn't really thought about that mm. and, and do you do you remember the first time you kind of were out in the field and were you mm. using some kit to better monitor volcanoes. I understand two of the sort of key ways are sort of around seismicity and around the gases mm-hmm. that they release. But do, do you want to talk us through your sort of first experience of that, of getting out and testing stuff in the wild? Sure. So just riffing on what you've just said, um, on a, a little bit like diagnosing disease in a patient via, say, for example, a differential diagnosis process, you'd, you'd want to have as many tools that you'd use in tandem in order to try and triangulate what's going on as rapidly as possible in the most expeditious manner. Um, On volcanoes, volcanoes do things before they erupt. They're not very subtle, not like earthquakes that, you know, just build up pressure and then, and then go, there may be signs there, but they're more um, harder to, harder to pin down Um, on volcanoes. Things happen Uh, that the ground might inflate um, as magma batches move underground that could be observed, for example, from satellites, um, things might get hotter again as 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 hot magmas move closer to the surface. That could be observed using thermal cameras. All of this underground ma- uh, movement, whether it's magmas or gases or some combination of the two, will generate seismicity earthquakes, which, as you mentioned, we can measure as well. And then lastly, the gases themselves, which is what I've been mostly involved in. Um, which, if you, which if you, it's almost like you're breathalyzing the volcano, really, to try and figure out has it had too much to drink, you know, maybe to follow that <laughs> example. But maybe to push that a little bit further, it's 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 not just about working out has it had too much to drink, i.e., what is the gas composition of its of its breath. It's also trying to work out its its breathing patterns because volcanoes, how they breathe. Is, is very important to work out, for example, has a volcano held its breath for too long, in which case that might be preceding, preceding an eruption. Um, shall, I, shall I keep, I've sort of- No, no, that's great, no, that's great. So it's not yeah. just about the composition and the mix of the gases, it's very much about the time as well is, is a key element that's, you're saying, right? That's right, exactly. And look, going back to what you originally asked, and forgive me for being a bit circuitous, um, yeah, the first the first time I worked on a volcano, look, I I think I have have always had and, and still maintain this 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 sense of wonderment, almost bewilderment that within, you know, we're, we're these like tiny insignificant creatures who clamber over these ig- enormous, you know, impressive um, mountains of fire. And it's not just in volcanology. This happens in all sorts of other areas of science where the where the the object or the subject of our of our investigation is far physically grander than we are i remain in sheer amazement that through our tiny minds we're able to develop technology that can be applied that can tell us anything all anything at all <laughs> so i think i think um i have had yeah so i think no matter how well you've you've planned and planning is absolutely key when you get there and it actually works there's always a giddiness and there's always goosebumps of pinching yourself and thinking it actually worked. <laughs> well, of course <laughs> it worked, but you know, so I suppose there's a kind of childlike joy in that. And this certainly was the first time, the first time I went, the, the first time I went to a volcano and uh, well, anyway, um, it, it did actually, it did actually erupt at Messiah volcano in Nicaragua. It had a, um, 
I when, was, when, when was this, Andrew? So this was in 2001. This was with this was with Clive Oppenheimer, mm. and um, and 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 actually that when 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 the volcano erupted, we we actually missed it. We'd been at the summit. We went away. We heard about it, so we returned that evening, and um, to to a site which I'll never forget. Um, there's a car park next to the summit crater, and when we got up to the car park. Um, all there was the smell of burning asphalt because the the magma bombs that had come out had had had, had melted the asphalt and there was there was smoke everywhere because these these bombs had also set fire to the grass surrounding the crater and so it, I, I was met by a scene that i'll never forget there was this great big black hole the crater surrounded by a ring of fire the grass which was all on fire and smoldering because it had been ignited by all this all this material and then this really um fell smell in in the air so that i've not told you about monitoring but i've told you about my first sort of experience of a volcano which was not passive very very volcanic <laughs> well that's that's a great i mean it's quite a picture you've just painted i mean let, let's let's sort of get into the technology a little bit i mean why why is it important that we sort of keep pushing the status quo with the technology for forecasting and, and what are the bits where it, you know, your your sort of background you were saying was you started off with, I think, using lasers to look at mm -hmm. air pollution in the atmosphere. And so mm -hmm. I can see why you're into the gases side of it. Um, what are the sort of bits of tech that excite you in terms of either mm -hmm. stuff on the ground or, I don't know, even remote sensing stuff like satellites? What mm -hmm. What is it that gets you excited? So I've always been, I've always been a bit subversive. I, um, volcanology, from a, uh, I suppose, from a market point of view, it, it's not a big enough commercial market for technologies to be developed for that. Mm. And um, particularly given that many of the potential customers are in parts of the world where there isn't a lot of financial resource kicking around. So I've always, I've always been interested in being a bit disruptive. How can we adapt something which was really purposed for something else and how can we use it in this context? So um, look, it's, it's not just me. There's lots and lots of other people in the world who've been sort of at the same kind of thing. Um, but in particular, I've been interested in drone technology, which has advanced hugely over the last decade or so. Um, I've also been interested in, in, camera, in camera technology as well, in particular, repurposing the kind of sensors that are in our smartphones to see if we can use them for volcanic applications. And I, mm. I guess one of the similar, similarities between all of the things that I've tried to do has been to try and hit a low price point. In other words, to try and take something which um, maybe a commercial supplier might be able to develop on a price point of just say, out of thin air, 50 to 100,000 pounds, some, something like that. My question has always been, well, could we develop something that maybe costs you know, a fraction of that, maybe even just a few thousand pounds, something like that. And look, it's probably gonna, not gonna work as well, but can we get it to work well enough? So that's been my the the, the 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 point being that so that people have access to this sort of technology where in places that need it, presumably. That's right, and even and and, yeah. and even just because, um, you know, even just from our point of view in terms of field science, working on volcanoes is is a mucky, dirty, smelly, ashy business, and you know things get dropped. You're not in a controlled lab environment, so you know mm. a, a trip can be a very expensive problematic trip if you're carrying the mm. 100 grand piece of kit <laughs> so we've just been talking sort of for looking forward a bit on technology and and i mean i suppose we i've almost done this the wrong way around i mean in the past how have scientists predicted eruptions what's been the sort of equipment people have traditionally used going back so going like going way back in the day almost time to the you know almost back to you know thinking about when science was was almost you know gentlemen scholars who'd you know wander around wearing tweed and that sort of thing um um the, the se se seismology has always been the linchpin of it it's always it's always been very important seismometry Se seismology in one way or another has been around for a very long time um, gas measurements likewise have been around for a long time as well um, but the, the traditional approach would have been to physically collect gas samples from volcanic craters or, or, or fumaroles then take them back we're, to we're literally talking like flasks here or that's like... right that's right glassware i mean really you know mm. the most exciting chemistry experiment you could field trip you could <laughs> you could imagine and 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 look not 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 knocking that because 
that's told us a lot and and it literally goes straight to the horse's mouth so if you if you want to know what's going on that would be a very good way of finding out what's going on um, but obviously there are challenges associated with that in terms of obviously safety um, and in addition to that there's challenges in terms of just getting time series because someone needs to physically return each time you want a new data point which is which is which is problematic so um i i suppose over the last in terms of the gas certainly within the last i suppose 30 to 40 years people have increasingly turned to trying to use remote sensing whereby instead of physically accessing the gas there's some way of inferring the gas release uh, from afar uh, normally by just looking at how light from the from the sky is 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 passes through the volcanic gases mm -hmm. and um the, the gases absorb light in a particular colors or particular wavelengths of light. And, and on, the, on the basis of that knowledge, we can infer how much gas is coming out or maybe the concentrations. Um, so the, sat the, sat the satellites aren't seeing the gases, they're seeing the effect it has on light. Yeah. 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 So that, that's what they measure. But then you can back out from that gas, you know, so for example, um, uh, you know, some of the satellites that were used um, that, that have been up now for decades to look at ozone concentrations can be can be repurposed to look at sulfur dioxide emissions from volcanoes mm. um, because both of those rely on looking at the ultraviolet absorption mm -hmm. caused caused mm -hmm. by both of those species and those remote sensing measurements can be performed from space or they can be performed from ground so you can there's various different ways of doing this but um, for example with camera technology you can develop technology which could look at the volcanoes and you through the data processing, you would see um, the gases coming out of the top of the of of, of the volcano, a little, and it would look a little bit like a thermal camera image, where you'd see you know a false color representation of the escape of mm. heat or the escape of gas in this in this case. That's really helpful. And so tell me, Andrew, about sort of the, some of the technology you have developed and why it's a sort of improvement. And, and uh, I think also we were just talking about you were just talking about how. Drones are important. I, I, I'd also wondered if you could touch a bit on what they sort of bring to the party. Yeah, yeah. So, um, of you know, over the last say fifteen years or so, I've been most interested in uh, drones um, for for a season. And what drones what drones bring to the party is a, a mechanism of um, taking uh, sensing equipment that actually needs to be within the volcanic gases. And getting that equipment within the gases in a way that doesn't involve a human being at, being in the gases, and so the, there's an implicit safety attached to that. Um, there are other technological challenges that have to be overcome, namely, you know, finding a drone that can do this job. Um, you know, making sure that the drone isn't adversely affected by being in the gases, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But that that would be the big um, obvious advantage of, of of that kind of approach. And we we started, you know, we had our first punt at this in 2007, uh, which is, you know, ages ago. And, and since then, so this is long before you could go and just buy a drone off the shelf from, you know, DJI or, or a manufacturer yeah. like that, which had built in autopilot, which you could control from a smartphone or from a device. Um, we, uh, I could, I could sense that something was going to happen in this area. So we, we, if you like, tried to, kind of uh, do something in this space on the basis of the technology that was available at that time. And of course, since then, we've seen drones proliferate absolutely massively within the consumer environment, um, within the consumer market, and drones have been incredibly useful in surveying in, in, in a wide variety of scientific application areas. And, and what can we sort of quantitatively with like numbers or sort of qualitatively, can we sort of say what the sort of success rate has been for these drones you know what difference have they made to better forecasting eruptions well i think in terms of so i think it's again going back to what i said before i think it's really important to recognize that this is a multi-parametric problem and and there there actually isn't a silver bullet i think there's been some mm. approaches which have made a really big difference um but i think there i don't think there is a silver bullet i think i think they've helped i think that they've provided um a degree of uh, being able to access in certain contexts, which would be really problematic otherwise. Um, but I, I, I just want to be, I just want to be careful not to, uh, just to recognize that there's, you know, there's, there's many different angles of attack here, and it's, mm. it's, it's very important to emphasize that they all need to work um, in tandem, yeah, if yeah. you like. 
No point taken. They're not a panacea. Um, yeah. And so, so you know, on that sort of point, I'm of you know using lots of tools mm. to try and figure out the risk from volcanoes. I'm assuming there's like you end up with horrendous amounts of data. Mm. I, I guess if one of the things that's in the news at the moment is we're all a bit obsessed with chatbots and AI, mm. does that hold much promise for a better mm. understanding? That mm. data and the risk. <laughs> Should we ask Chat GPT to predict? I was going to say, why am I asking? Why am I asking you? I'll just go and ask Bing or Bard or other products are available. <laughs> oh, it's fascinating, isn't it? it? It's so it's so interesting, isn't it? It's actually it almost yeah it becomes quite philosophical. But anyway, I think we'll maybe draw a line in our conversation. <laughs> I think that um, so okay. Going back to where we were going earlier. The, there's a requirement to gain more data uh, because with more data, we can get a, a, a more accurate fix on, on, on behavior, just as, for example, has been absolutely essential in the development of diagnostic me medicine. Um, there are, and, and, and so then the, the, pro the challenge comes, how do you process that? How do you, you know, big data, how do, how do we actually handle this? Now, the good, I suppose the good news is computing power has increased massively computing cost has decreased massively and um, data science look data science was kind of always there but data science is really is really a thing now so there's there's a lot of resource being devoted to that so I think I think you're right I think that as um, as we get better at collecting data and as we end up just you know being drowned in the stuff increasingly uh, the, the the job of the data scientist becomes very very important in this in this regard. So you know if these guys could maybe just take a break from you know inventing essays, <laughs> we could we could use that resource. <laughs> <laughs> Let's hope so. I'm sure they I'm sure they're probably already working on it. Uh, so um, uh, what challenges have you faced? Um, you know you were talking earlier on about how no two volcanoes are the same i don't know what were some of the challenges you faced mm. i think i so i think there's that and i think as well um i think always as as an inventor you always have i suppose the challenge of kind of following through on your instincts so you know you can have an idea and it might be that your idea is actually quite different from everybody else's idea because you know for for example if you know, let's just say, um, you know, ultraviolet camera monitoring of volcanoes, which is something I've been involved mm -hmm. in. Um, you know, the, the you know, scientific instrument manufacturers do make units which would be, you know, perfectly useful in this application, albeit at you know quite a quite a big price point or relatively large price point. So uh, we had a bit of an intuition that, well, you know, basically maybe we can get smartphone cameras to do the same thing. And so that that's a great idea, a bit of a madcap idea um, put together by a group of friends and colleagues in a pub. So that's great. So then the question is, how do you track from that to an actualized product that actually works in the wild? And as you know, and have probably heard a hundred times before, that takes a lot of stickability and tenacity and trial and error to, to, you know, to get that across the line. And I think from my point of view, one of the great challenges I've always got is particularly if, for example, there's a PhD on the line, is how, how long do you spend pushing something um, and when do you abandon ship? And, and when is it kind of foolish to continue? And when, mm -hmm. you know, and when is it brave? <laughs> One man's bravery is another man's folly. <laughs> so I always, and look, I suppose I've been fortunate in that, you know, I have managed to push a few things through to the point where they've actually worked. But, you know, and there's such joy in that success, but there's every single step is a challenge and you constantly second guess yourself and you constantly and did think, Sorry, did the did the smartphone for UV thing pan out? Yes, it did. So we, yeah. and again, it was this almost David and Goliath story of we, you know, we we knew we knew that the the architecture of modern day smartphones should allow good UV sensitivity. So in principle, based on the engineering specifications, we thought this should work. Um, so a PhD student in our team basically was given the job of of now we didn't actually start hacking apart iPhones because that's 
a thousand pounds ago. We worked instead with, um, I don't know if you're familiar with Raspberry Pi technology and mm, yeah, yeah, ra- yeah, Raspberry Pi yeah. cameras. So the cameras attached to them are basically smartphone cameras, except with the huge advantage that they cost 30 or 40 pounds. So we, um, we, we basically bought up the UK stock of these, of these cameras. And, and then proceeded to uh, destructively test them until we'd figured out what we were doing. Brilliant. Um, and so I wondered, just in terms of like people listening, thinking, oh, this is all very curious and interesting, Andrew, and be fascinating to you. But I wondered if you could sort of, uh, presumably this stuff is having a real world impact. I wondered if you could give any sort of anecdotes or stats mm. on the difference you've made in terms of actually lowering risk from volcanoes Mm. so i think look a lot of the you know technologies that i've been involved in previously in one way or another and again it's it's not me it's not just me there's been there's been many other people in this field um a number of them have 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 been spun out and are being used you know in all sorts all sorts of locations across the planet and again I, I wouldn't want to claim that, you know, any one of these diagnostic approaches is is the panacea, going back to your word that, that's been used earlier. But, you know, I think this has played a role in terms of increasing the um, the surveillance capacity of volcano observatories. Uh, in terms of the smartphone technology, that's, that's, uh, that's being adapted now to a point where it can be deployed autonomously. So a number of units are now being autonomously deployed on volcanoes. Um, so that that's a, that's that's a new sort of exciting development, and we'll see where that goes over the next couple of years. Got you. Um, and how you know you've talked about access and cost a few times. It seems to be like recurring themes. Mm. How important is this tech to people who live in low or middle income countries? I think it's. I think it. I think it is potentially helpful because of of the of the price point, and I think the price point is is a differentiator. Um, in terms of the most recent thing, which is which is the smartphone technology, uh, we've we've got um, a number of those units now just going out as as in- installations in in a number of locations in South America. Um, so we'll see how that goes, and then hopefully thereafter that can be proliferated further to different parts of the world. What sort of countries are we talking about there? Just in case people are listening from one of those. So um, Ecuador and and Chile right now. Yeah. Right. Got you. Got you. And lots of uh, interesting stuff in uh, Chile in, in terms of volcanoes. Um, and sort of, sort of changing tax slightly. I mean, presumably a lot of this takes, you know, we've talked about costs and time and resource. I mean, how much, what difference does sort of the rolex mate to your work mm. and obviously you've i think you've received awards from them as well mm. just give a little sense of how that helps so look rolex have been just wonderful in in so many different ways um and i'm i'm so grateful for that um there's been the benefit of the award and i mentioned earlier that often often in our work we've tried to path find paths really for the first time and um, sometimes it can be difficult to gain traction with the, with the funding council where you're where you really are trying to be into you know a, a be off track completely and and rolex have been marvelous about seeing some of those things and then getting behind them and enabling things to happen that wouldn't have happened otherwise so for that i'm i'm very grateful indeed the other thing I'm very grateful for is that there's there's a huge network, and I think you might have spoken to some other people within that network, and having access to those people, sharing stories with them, um, getting to know them, collaborating with them. I've worked with some of them on, on, on different mm. projects. has been a, a, an absolute honor and, and privilege. Um, and, you know, again, what, one thing I've found amongst the Rolex people is that and I, there's people have been around the block. They've seen success. They've seen failure. And I think that brings a real degree of reality mm. and humility. And and it's meant that those people are just very, very pleasant to work with. Mm, that's really interesting, especially the point about sort of traditional public sources of funding, you know, from research councils and so on, not necessarily always mm. suiting the sort of yeah, off piste kind of stuff. Mm. Um, and... So I guess this is the point where I sort of want to zoom out a little bit and go all big picture and look forwards a little, Andrew. Uh, I mean, just tell people a bit about what your 
working towards next in your quest mm. to sort of better understand mm. and predict volcanic activity? Well, I think the, the next steps are, um, so the, the smartphone technology that I mentioned that I spoke of earlier, um, that's being autonomously deployed at the moment, um, which, is a, which is a reasonably new development. And so what the next step on that will be to observe the data and then go into listening mode to see what we can see in terms of how things may change in advance of future eruptions. So this is where we, you know, we go from, if you like, having sweated on making the thing work to sweating about thinking about what it's what it's telling us. So it's changing tech a little bit. I think that's that's very important in terms of next step. Um, there's another project that we've been involved in, um, which is with NASA. Uh, NASA have have been in touch as well regarding using some of the sensor technology for a potential application on the moon. Um, so there's been there's been some work there working with them to try and engineer a unit which could potentially be used in terms of looking for hydroxyl within the lunar atmosphere, um, which is which is released from water in the lunar rocks. Therefore, it's very important going forward, potentially in terms of the Artemis missions. Now, I don't know if that unit will get launched, but it's been a it's been a wonderful project in terms of you know we talked about going off piste. Well, this is really <laughs> off planet off yeah there off, you go That's off right. planet love it yeah love it love it uh, and i mean oh, this is you know this sort of technology you're working on it you know the smartphones and the drones and the other you know more traditional sensors and stuff i mean this is sort of potentially life-saving tech right uh i mean i wonder do you think you know you said the i think when we started out talking you said how the risk from volcanoes has come down mm. do you think we're ever going to get to a point where we sort of mm abolish the risk that you know this sort of age-old threat poses mm, that's a that's a marvelous question look ha, i don't even <laughs> know it's a it's a wonderful question i don't even i'm not sure i even have the framework in which to answer it but maybe maybe let let me say this i think um yeah that's that's a that's a for absolutely brilliant brilliant question. I mean is is it even is it even the right goal to aim for to fully abolish it or is it you know Yeah. I, yeah. I don't want to get too too philosophical about this but yeah. No, no it's 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 a great question where well, you've you've got, you've got me thinking about this one. I think one of the great challenges is um I suppose in science how do you how do you ever know that you know, right? This that this that old this that old question, you know, you you can you know what you don't know. Yeah, we think we're we're good on that, but you don't know if you fully know. So I suppose we're we're, we're walking, and I have got philosophical. I'm sorry, it's your fault. Though. Um, but you you what what we what we do with time is we become more and more aware of how individual volcanoes will behave or the sorts of behaviors we might see in advance of eruptions. So we we can know that that will become something that we we get better at we get better at with time as we get more data and more understanding of how to interpret those data. But can we ever imagine that we'll be in a scenario where there won't be a kind of black swan event where a volcano does something completely out of the box? Um, I, I, I suppose statistically it would become less likely as we know more, but could we ever philosophically know that we We'll know everything. I don't know. <laughs> You've got me there, though. Is, I'll, I'll take it back to more concrete brass tacks, and I guess maybe like, is there like a volcano that you would single out as an example where we've, because of technology like yours and others in the field, we've massively hmm. decreased the risk? Yes, and I think, um, and again, I think, for example, some of the Italian volcanoes like Etna and and Stromboli. There's been so much just spectacularly good work, um, mostly by Italian scientists who've developed technologies, who've deployed them there, who very conscientiously and assiduously uh, collected data and then then monitored it, analyzed it eruption after eruption after eruption, and, and with great intelligence observed what's going on. I would say we could certainly say that those have been, again, things can happen which can be out of the box, but those have been absolute masterclass examples of what to do and and how how we could really come to a better understanding and thereby reduce risk so yes i think i think that would be a, a really good example mm, that's really welcome thanks uh, and i suppose coming to the hopey question and thinking of volcanoes but also more widely 
how hopeful are you for humanity's future and the environment around us? I thought we that's were a big, that's a that's a big that's a big question. I appreciate. I thought <laughs> philosophy was gone. No, I so I I so I'm I'm interested. We haven't really discussed this so far, but uh, I'm interested in technologies in a in a whole broad suite of senses in terms of addressing problems that exist in the world. Obviously, uh, up until now in my career, I, fo- I focus mostly on, on volca- in, in a volcanic sense. Um, I'm, I'm a mixture of, of someone full of hope and someone who's a realist as well. But what gives me enormous hope, and this is a bit philosophical, is that actually we, we, we have agency here. We can, we can do things. So in a sense, going back to the example of what we did with the smartphone, you know, in a sense, who would have thought that um, it was just three of us working on this? Who would have thought that the three of us, using our smarts and a lot of tenacity and a lot of destroyed Raspberry Pi cameras, could have cracked this problem in a way that would be really useful in volcanology? And and that that gives me hope. And I think another thing that gives me real hope is the fact that nowadays, and I think in a way for the first time ever, We've actually got accessible research technologies that everybody can could use. We've got 3D printing. We've got very low cost computing, for example, through Raspberry Pis. And so if you if you wanted to, and I know everybody's going to want to do this, if you wanted to, you could actually figure out how to invent something um, that could solve a problem and you could develop a little gadget that could do that. Now, I can't think of another time in history. Well, I suppose this is maybe always you know, there's always been the tinkerers in the garden shed. It's just that we've got more, more sophisticated technologies open to us. I think we're at a wonderful time when we can actually use these technologies to try and, to try and solve problems. And another thing I'm involved in right now is working in schools because schools actually have got tinkerers and they've got makers and they've got programmers. And so actually there's a lot of 14 and 15 year olds who, who actually could solve some of these problems. And that gives me a huge hope. That's really helpful. So would I be fair in summarizing that it's ingenuity and the sort of wider talent pool that we almost have now, the fact that like 8 billion people can get involved rather than 1 billion and the next generation, is that a fair way of summarizing it? I, th- I think so. And I think, you know, you know, humans are a mixed bag, right? You know, there's great things and there's not so great things. But one facet to human beings is we, we, can't, we can't help ourselves but solve problems. It's almost like it's a fundamental. Um, I, just before we got on the call, I was just thinking about a, a, someone called Neville Maskelyne, who I don't know, you may or may not have heard of, but he was, he was a scientist. And he, he figured out a way in, the, in, the, last, in the, the 19th century, I think it was, but he figured out a way of being able to weigh the earth by just getting some pendulums on the side of a mountain in Scotland called Shehalian that I've climbed many times. And he looked at just the slight deflection of the angle of the pendulum on each side of the, each side of the, each side of the mountain. And, and in doing that, he was able to figure out, you know, um, on the basis of very rudimentary technology, how heavy the earth is. So I, I, you know, it's incredible. Like basically a man in breeches with, you know, it had been a bit more sophisticated than this, but two clamps, two strings and two balls figured out how heavy the earth is. And he got it pretty much exactly right. I mean, it's absolutely <laughs> incredible. So that, that gives me hope. So what I'm wondering now is, well, you know, what about these kids, you know, who can 3D print and who can know how to raspberry, but how, how to do some Python programming with raspberry Pis? I think they, I think they can develop incredible things going forwards. Well, that's a great note to finish on. Um, thank you so much for your time, Andrew. It's been a pleasure. Thank you very much indeed.